I, wrong is the incorrect word, something different than single player. It just feels right, and it still performs. You know, the frame rate's a lot, it's still a lot better for multiplayer. Um, so yeah, it was, it was things like that, as well as the balance. Okay, and what was it like working uh, in the studio that really has like two offices uh, in completely separate cities? Like, was it more difficult trying to work between the Edmonton and uh, I? Forget what the other office was. It's the Montreal. I'm in the Montreal office. Okay. Right. Yeah. Was there any difference between like traveling things, or was it just everything was purely digital, so it's a bit easier? Or no, I I would say face to face is always the best way to work, especially in a big game. So the second you're starting to work uh, over multiple studios, multiple time zones, like there is some loss there. Now we tried to minimize that loss. Um, so we use VidCon a lot and, you know, that way we have big video conferences and we look at the game, but that's, and, and we, we got this thing called Spawn Labs basically. So if somebody was playing the game in Edmonton, we could see it, you know, without having to look at a, like a webcam pointed at a TV, with the bad like video quality we'll get out of that. Spawn Labs helped us kind of get a better picture of what's going on. So that came on kind of late. Um, but the real thing you miss when you work in two different studios is those little conversations that happen in the halls or right around people's desks. And so you have to be a lot more diligent to loop people in. So, for example, I was the only gameplay designer in Montreal, which meant I was kind of like on an island by myself and working with just Edmonton people, which meant I had to go extra out of my way when I was stuck to ask someone a question or to go, hey, what did you guys talk about here? Or, hey, I can't make this meeting. Can someone make sure you loop me in? Or, hey, can you make sure that you fill me in all these little decisions that you made, or, you know, having a beer at the uh, pub, pub last night? Um, and it's just about diligence. It'll never replace face-to-face -face communication. But we made it work, I think. You know, there were there were rough spots where you're just like, I have no idea what's going on over there. And there were times where I didn't know where some of my coworkers were doing on the gameplay team because I was kind of just working on powers and they were just churning on weapons or uh, AI and they didn't get a job with all that stuff. Um, but then you would see it a few days later or weeks later and you'd be like, holy crap, that's amazing. Nice. So uh, what was the kind of like also... Uh, Knowing that you had to uh, sort of program for uh, all the major uh, platforms, like you know, for the 360, PS3, and PC, uh, you know, is it kind of easy to transfer over between them? Is there anything that automatically translates, or do you have to, you know, have someone individually parse out the code for each console? What you try to do generally is. Uh, set your code base up so that the vast majority of your code is just the same across all three platforms. Um, it's not 100% possible, especially with the architecture difference between the PS3 and the 360 and, and PC. The 360 and PC are pretty close. Uh, the PS3 is its own different kind of hairy beast, frankly. So what you do is you, you set that architecture up and then there are like hardcore programmers who are way smarter and more talented than me who go and they, they handle the optimization per platform and do the little things that need to be done behind the scenes, like memory management and you know the sound processing and all that sort of thing uh, to make it work on those different platforms. The, the nice thing that happened the nice thing that happened for us was Mass Effect 2, uh, a PS3 version was made later. And so that kind of became the beginning of what the Mass Effect 3 engine was, because a lot of the hard work to make our engine work on PS3 was done then. So then we could start building off of that uh, more solid base for you know Mass Effect 3. And that was really helpful, and the engineers did an amazing job trying to do that. Uh, I know some people have mentioned that there's you know some frame rate issues occasionally on the PS3, and and it and it doesn't. Unfortunately, all the platforms are never going to be the same. Like I had a friend come over to me, and he was like. Oh, I played all the Mass Effect games on 360, and then I got an awesome computer now, and I played it on PC, and it's running at like 60 frames a second. And now I'm sad because consoles aren't going to run at 60 frames a second. It's because the PC could just be so much more powerful. Uh, that that it's you, it's a balancing act, right? There's never a perfect solution, unfortunately. But I think we did a pretty good job at the end of the day. Okay, so personally, you know, completely unrelated from a profession, what console do you prefer? Uh, I do personally play on the 360 more. Um, there's a few reasons for that. I, I think a the I have more games on the 360, and I bought. So when a game is cross-platform, I, I think what you find in general is uh, 
games that are cross-platform tend to uh, tend to perform a little bit better on the 360. At least, especially that was really definitely the case early on. Now it's a little, it's a, a lot better. But early on in the console's history, like those first few PS3 games, and when there was a 360 version, the 360 version was way better. Like it just was a lot smoother. It didn't have all these like visual tearing and stuff like that. And um, so because of that reason, I got that. And then if I want to play with friends online, like most of my friends are on Xbox Live. I don't play a ton of multiplayer. I'll obviously play, be playing a ton of Mass Effect multiplayer. Um, but I play mostly co-op multiplayer. Like I play through Gears of War 3 co-op with my best friend back from actually, the, I'm from the D.C. area actually too, by the way. Oh, nice. uh, I grew up in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, so not too far from where you guys are. Um, so I'll play with my buddy, you know, back back home, and we'll play through Gears of War 3, and, and that's great to do on the 360. Uh, I do have some amazing games on the PS3, though, like the Uncharted series is one of my favorite. Like, Uncharted 2 is just absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, Dark Souls and Demon Souls are, are phenomenal games that are, you know, the first one at least, at least was only on the 360, or the uh, PS3, I believe. Um, so I do use my PS3 a decent amount, and PS3 has some amazing indie games. I'm a big indie game guy. Um, so like everyday shooter and some of the pixel junk games, uh, I, I love those things. And you can't get them on any other platform. I can't wait for Journey to come out from that game company in a couple of weeks, which looks just got amazing reviews this week and looks beautiful. Um, so I love all my consoles. I, I will admit, actually, I don't play my Wii very much. That's probably the least played console of everything. Uh, but I do tend to play on the 360 a little more. Yeah, good to hear about the Wii thing. Like I picked it up, but now it's. I, I just can't bring myself to play anymore. You know, now I have the connect and move. Yeah, I don't have a connector move. Uh, my my apartment's kind of small, um, I don't, so I don't haven't gotten those yet. But um, yeah, the Wii like just doesn't have any games that I'm interested in. I like the last game I played a lot on it was like the Punch Out because I love Punch Out, uh, and I played that for you know 50 plus hours, and then I was kind of done, and I haven't picked up anything for the Wii since. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think that that's the long story of the Wii. Um, that, but I know a lot of people and a lot of my readers are uh, constantly asking me if I have, you know, any tips for them to break into the games industry as a designer. And unfortunately, I'm a writer. I don't know anything about, <laughs> right. about that. Do you have any tips that you'd like to share, you know, based off your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, it's... You know, I, I got asked that question a lot, and I think there's some huge misconceptions because most people who ask that question don't realize they didn't get into games. Actually, they think that games is like, game design is coming up with ideas, and ideas are only like you know the beginning. It's all about the execution. There's a lot of games out there that have really amazing ideas but couldn't execute them that well. And so what that means is you need to have some sort of ability to either code or uh, do art or level building or something that's gonna put something towards the end product so my suggestion always it sounds silly but like it's really just build games like there's so many ways to build games nowadays there's there's the udk there's unity there's uh all these there's game maker there's all these different things depending on what your programming or non-programming skill is that you can that let you make a game and just like make really shitty games and the more more games you make and the more crappy games you make, uh, eventually you'll start figuring out how to make good games, and, like, that'll come out of that. And if you love that creation of game, then you'll be made for this industry. But the thing that's really important for anybody who might be listening who wants to get into games is, like, just because you love playing games doesn't mean you'll love making games. They're very different beasts. Like, there's a reason that this is a very difficult job, and, and you have to love the act of creation and not just oh I love playing games. Okay. Now have, have you like started to kind of turn a more critical eye to the games that you play now that you're actually seeing the design then like have you ever played a game and be like, oh why did they do this? They could just you know change this to this so much better. Uh, yeah, other fun part of being a video game developer, designer, uh, basically most games are ruined at this point. Like, you know exactly what they did or about what they did, and you see all the little warts that nobody else would ever see. Or you just sit there, and you're like, oh, how did they implement this cover thing? And then you start to play with it for like 10 minutes at home, and you're like, wait, I'm not playing the game at all. I'm like getting into analytical mode. So you got to learn to turn that part of your brain off. It's kind of hard. It does, it'll never fully turn off, but it's kind of in the background there absorbing information but yeah no game games are a little they're less fun i still love playing video games i'm not saying i don't like video games but they are 
when the magic is gone, right? Like, you know, you've been to the sausage factory, you see how the sausage is made. Uh, it's, it's not as sexy, maybe, all, all the time. Now, what do you think of uh, the game, or non-game, depending on uh, some people's interpretations, uh, Dear Esther? Have you had a chance to get your hands on that? Absolutely. I, I played through it a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I That is not a kind of game I would normally play or think I would like. It's not the kind of games I'm interested in making. It's a very exploratory, narrative-driven game. The only mechanic is walk, really. Um, and what's amazing is I got to the end of that. It's about an hour and 45 minutes, I think, it took me to play. Um, and I was almost crying at the end. Like, there were tears in my eyes. Like, no lie. Like, it was so emotionally impactful. And I hate the concept uh, that people go, this is not a game or this is a game, because that's a completely reductive uh, discussion. Whether or not it's the kind of game you're interested in or the kind of game that you believe games should be is different. You're allowed to have your opinion on that. But it is still a game. Um, and what we need to be doing as an industry is going wide and trying all these different amazing of creating games and pushing the envelope and some will work and some won't and maybe some will be really niche like Dear Esther or something but you can't say that's not a game because it really just harms our ability to grow as an art form and be more more successful uh, and I don't mean successful monetarily but I mean just like acceptance among mass mass media or mass just the people so I, th I definitely think Dear Esther is a game I think anybody who can handle playing a game that isn't just shooting things should go to Steam, buy Dear Esther for ten dollars, support those guys. It's amazing. Um, it's 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 an absolutely wonderful product that I, that I thought was emotionally impactful, and I think really challenged my ideas on what games are or can be. Because again, like I said, that's I'm a systems guy. I build like you know powers and systems and all that sort of stuff. I I feel like hey, games are about that dynamics and and all those interactions, not just walking around. But that walking around was just as impactful. Okay, so you, you also just mentioned uh, games as arts and kind of improving the uh, industry through that. But like, how important do you think that concept is to some of your uh, you know, fellow designers and uh, developers? Like, is it something that's constantly on their mind, or is it just you know build what we like best and then you know see how it fits into the great picture later? Um, you know, I think everybody has their own different ways. Some people go, what are the... So, so some way, one way of building games, not my personal favorite way, is go, what's popular? What will make a lot of money? And how can I build that? Or what are the mechanics that already exist for that? And what can I take from those and kind of, you know, put out in a more polished form to make money? You, you see this happening all over the industry in, in social and AAA and, and less than indie. Uh, but it still happens in India as well on mo and on mobile. Um, that to me is n a non-ethical way of building a game. And I don't mean like being influenced by something. I mean like straight up copying. That's not ethical. Uh, however, the thing of I'm just going to build a game that I want to play. I think that's a great way to build a game. Because you have passion behind it. And that passion will drive you when it's one in the morning and you're tired and you haven't seen your wife or kids or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever in a while and you're cranky and you know that passion is going to drive you and working on something that you don't believe in won't so I'm a firm believer in work on the kind of games you want some people want to work on things that would be considered very mass market some people want to work on Dear Esther and make some, these really weird quirky indie games and like everyone should just do what they like and I think the audience will kind of come if you market yourself and market and you're doing something good and interesting like Dear Esther wasn't polished it didn't have awesome graphics and sound and really interesting writing and kind of a narrative it, it wouldn't work but that's what the game is about and they did make sure they spent all their money on that and it totally totally like works as a result so I'm a, just a big proponent of do what you love like I when I quit my last job, I came to Bioware because I was like, I want to work on the games that I love and that are the, the top-tiered stuff. And it was definitely Mass Effect was like on the top of the list, maybe tied with like Fallout 3 at the time because Fallout's my favorite franchise ever. Like those were the two games that were like 1A, 1B. Um, and, and I made sure, I, I, and I said to myself, I was like, if I can't work at the jet place I want to work, I'll just 
go indie and make my own game. I'm not going to go work for a company and make 70 rated games anymore. Like, I, I can't do that. It's 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 not good enough 